Good afternoon. My name is Tatiana Flores from Rutgers University, and I'm introducing Florencia San Martin. Florencia has a BA in studio art um, from the Catholic University in Chile, Santiago, Chile. And then she came to New York and did an MFA in creative writing and Spanish at NYU um, before coming to Rutgers, um, where she earned her MA and is a um, soon-to-be PhD degree holder. She just defended her dissertation last Monday. Um, Florencia has held fellowships from the CONICIT, the uh, Chilean um, national entity, um, from the Center for Cultural Analysis at Rutgers, from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, where she was a Patricia and Philip, Philip Frost Fellow in 2017-2018, and a dissertation completion grant from Rutgers. Her dissertation is titled The Decolonial Project of Alfredo Yar, and um, it sheds light on the intersection of decolonial theory and art history, and also um, uh, uh, discusses the early work of Yar and how it has informed recurring themes over the course of his career. Um, she will be uh, teaching Latin American film and Latin American art this fall at the School of Visual Arts, and she will also be working on a monograph on the Chilean artist Jorge Tacla, in collaboration with the Archives of American Art, um, as well as turning, of course, to um, turning her dissertation into a book. And lastly, she's um, in the process of editing a special issue for Arts Journal on decolonizing contemporary Latin American art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. It was a pleasure and an honor to be your student these seven years. And thank you so much for the organizers. And also, gracias a mis papás que están acá. My parents are here. OK. On September 11th of 1973 in Chile, a bloody U.S. packed civic military dictatorship drastically affected and continue affecting the life, dignity, and memory politics of millions. Thousands were killed, millions were imprisoned, tortured, or forced to exile, an entire society is still looking for truth and justice. As is well known today in critical memory studies in the Southern Cone, the systematic violations of human rights during the 17th year dictatorship led by General Augusto Pinochet in Chile, which formally ended in 1990, was not isolated from the implementation of neoliberalism, an advanced form of capitalism. Just as happened with capitalism in the 16th century in the laboratory of the so-called New World, in the 1970s, Chile, although with obvious different historical proportions, neoliberalism was imposed through a massive human and epistemological destruction. As Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano sarcastically put it, quote, Pinochet was torturing people so prices could be free. In 2010, on the eve of the 40th anniversary of the military coup in Chile, an unprecedented number of artists, writers, and filmmakers look back at the past to denounce the humanitarian crimes committed during the regime. The majority of these practices, however, turn human rights violation into spectacle, aiming to close the issue of the dictatorship through neoliberal policies embracing pardon and reconciliation using the ongoing suffering of an entire society through different forms of spectacle, the task of these practices was to forget, to look forward, to sell. In so doing, they made visible precisely the continuity of a more durable and ghostly regime, the free market, whose origins, just as that of the dictatorship, was the military coup of September 11th of 1973 in Chile. Such was the case, for instance, in the screen of Chile, the Forbidden Images, a TV series broadcasted on prime time on national television and advertised by large corporations, erroneously claiming to show for the very first time in Ch to the Chilean audience images of the dictatorship and thus ignoring the many documentaries made since the coup by filmmakers of the third cinema movement, such as Patricio Guzman, 
The series hosts a famous, if not the most famous, soap opera actor in Chile called Benjamin Vicuña, following a neoliberal script, asked the viewer, quote, Can we erase this episode from our memory? I hope we can, he remarked. Similar practices emerged in Chile around the same time. Using Primo Levi's concept of the gray zone, dozens of books by former victimizers recalling their crimes with Catholic regret were published, challenging the category of the victim and even asking for reparations from the state. A famous case was the many TV shows, journalistic records, and films using the infamous figure of El Mosito, a victimizer who worked alongside the head of the Chilean intelligence, Manuel Contreras. In Chile, however, as writer Diamela El Tit explains, the roles of victims and perpetrators were fairly clearly delineated. This was not the case in Peru, Colombia, or Mexico, where the victim-victimizer binary is much less rigidly defended and in which issues such as race, ethnicity, and indigeneity strongly came into play. But to be sure, in Chile, Primo Levi's concept of the gray zone has been misused as a neoliberal tool to pardon those who collaborated with the regime and that today are repentant, showing the problems of imagining concepts, ideas, and experiences as universal. Borrowing the term from the literary boom of the 60s and 70s, in which writers from Latin America, such as Gabriel García Márquez or Julio Cortázar, sought to replace the region's social backwardness by repudiating any link to tradition and thus championing newness and gaining the approval of the international market, Chilean cultural critic Nelly Richard coined this 2010 phenomenon in Chile as the Chilean memory boom. Although I generally agree with Richard, It is nonetheless important to acknowledge the aesthetic, historical, and political relevance of representational forms that both took distance from spectacle and repentance and also criticized these practices. One example is Alfredo Jarre's The Geometry of Conscious, a permanent memorial at the Museum of Human Rights in Santiago, Memory of Human Rights in Santiago. Delving on the conceptual strategies used by Jarre in this memorial and on the political and historical context in which it was created, I will first explain, I will explain how Jarre interrupts the frozen past of the majority of commemorative monuments, critiquing human rights occurred during the dictatorship and recognizing the ways in which the neoliberal legacy of the regime is manifested in today's Chile. To develop this argument, I will first examine an early and little-known work made by Jar addressing this relationship in dictatorship Chile as an antecedent of his 2012 memorial. And secondly, I will center on the geometry of consciousness, delving on a counter-narrative of the boom to think about memory today, as well as in the contingency of this memorial within current political demands. In his early series of work from 1974, Jar on a white sheet, simply writes four times the Spanish name Pablo, creating a vertical column at the center. Three Pablos in the drawing represent Pablos who died from different circumstances in 1973. One is the Chilean Nobel Prize of Literature, Pablo Neruda. The other one is Picasso. The third one is the te Catalan teles Pablo Casals. The identity of and the date of death of each of these Pablos is handwritten by Jar at the bottom of the drawing. Casals and Picasso were outspoken critics of Franco's military dictatorship in Spain. So was Neruda, who was consul in Paris in 1939, helped more than 2,000 Spaniards from the Republican left to flee Franco's regime. Moreover, Neruda himself was an outspoken critic of the relationship between neoliberalism and human rights violation. In his last collection of poems, Incitación al Nexonicidio y Alabanza a la Revolución Chilena, which was published in English in 1980, Neruda embraces the violent imposition of multinational free markets in the catastrophic consequences of this and the catastrophic consequences of this economic model in the life and dignity of an entire society. Neruda died only two weeks after the coup for reasons until under investigation. It is telling that as soon as 1974, Jar was 
taken as his historical point of departure the death of Neruda, as Neruda himself was a victim of the dictatorial neoliberal regime. It is within this narrative that we can better understand the meaning of the fourth Pablo in Jar's drawing. This Pablo in Jar's words, quote, symbolizes all the Pablos who disappeared after the coup. This information is also provided in the drawing. At the bottom right, Jar writes, quote, Anonymous 1973. Through a conceptual strategy, Jar turns a word, a personal pronoun, into a concept, embracing anonymity, disappearance, and collective ongoing mourning in dictatorship and post-dictatorship Chile. This is why Jar titled his work Pablo, 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 Pablo. It is not one nor two, but many. And those many are not only framed in the strict period of the dictatorship, but within its neoliberal aftermath, or better, within its neoliberal continuity. In George Pablo, past and an ongoing present, and the individual and the collective fused together, remembering us about a neoliberal state that ever since its implementation in dictatorship Chile, has not only prevented victims and their families to access to information and to achieve justice, but has also promoted pardon and forgetful. Not surprisingly, Jar has described Pablo as his first memorial. Indeed, not only this work demonstrates that the representation of memory in Chile and Latin America more broadly began way before memory debates entered academia in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, Memory, Jar seems to tell us, is not a practice that emerges after periods of violence, but one that parallels these periods. Furthermore, the interlacing of past and present and the individual and the collective that is at stake in George Pablo would remain in the artist's thinking and aesthetics as shown in his 2010 memorial, The Geometry of Consciousness. Commissioned by the newly inaugurated Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Santiago at the end of socialist Michel Bachelet's first term in office, just the geometry of conscious is located underground at the Museum Plaza. Viewers access to the memorial by descending 33 steps. Once inside the cubic-like installation, after one minute of full darkness, Hundreds of silhouettes, heads created by Jar after photographs of living and death Chileans start to light up on the front wall. Rendered in the form of a grid, the silhouettes multiply to infinity in mirrors located in continuous wall. The process lasts for 90 seconds, projecting an increasing intense light. Suddenly, all plunge back into darkness, creating a strong imprint on the viewer's retina. George's memorial thus refuses the possibility of passive spectatorship, interrupting the frozen past of commemorative monuments and resisting a fixed temporality that remembers the past as past. Through the juxtaposition of Silhouette's head, George's work embraces the idea that the regime has not finished. In turn, as the silhouettes are multiplied to infinity, George's memorial, just as his 1974 Pablo, portraits not only one or a certain fixed number of victims, but an entire society that is still affected by the dictatorship and its neoliberal continuity. In this sense, George Memorial highlights a conflict that has not been settled. It highlights the fact that disappearance and torture are not just individual problems, and that crimes did not just happen in the past, and they have a serious impact in the survivor, their families, the social environment, and the society overall. Plural pertains to a national coming to terms of the legacy of the dictatorship in the present, and connects on the one hand the fam famous mottos such as Donde están, where are they, used in street protests, protest since the very beginning of the dictatorship by families of the disappeared, and on the other hand, testimonies of former victims in the transition and post-transition period. It is known, for instance, that in the vast, vast desert of Atacama in northern Chile, where the world's largest radio telescope is located in a world-known facility called El Alma, or the Soul, the military buried thousands of bodies in secret graves.
While this happened historically 20, 30, or even 40 years ago, the families of the victims, themselves victims of the regime, go every day to the desert and they want to search. I wish the telescopes didn't just look into the sky, but they could also see through the air so we can find them, said a mother of a disappeared in Nostalgia for the Light, a 2013 film by third cinema filmmaker Patricio Guzman. I wish we could find them, she remarks, revealing that her searching is not individual, but collective. Her search is shared by an entire, entire society whose politics, social and cultural paradigms change drastically after the coup. In dialogue with this practice, George Memorial invites the viewer to participate in an ongoing politicization in the post-dictatorial struggle in which a denouncement of the neoliberal system of reconciliation, pardon and oblivion is a state, is a stake. Distancing from the, uh, indeed, on the eve of the 40th anniversary of the coup, other voices with jar link to the traumatic past and its legacy also emerge, repoliticizing society and achieving important advances within the justice system. This is exemplary shown in the student movement of, of 2010 where thousands of students went out to the street demanding free education. They criticized the educational reforms made during the dictatorship, in which education, just as every aspect in the citizen's experience, became a private good for a small, privileged sector in society. They criticized, in a word, the neoliberal legacy of the dictatorship in the present. Other type of protest in the current post-dictatorial neoliberal streets are public space protests known as FUNAS. This type of protest, protest began in Chile in 1999, coinciding with, with Pinochet's house arrest in London and his release a year later when he was received in Chile as a hero. Since then on, people have gone out to the street protesting impunity back by both the neoliberal government and the justice system. Protester exposed perpetrators' crime at their residences, chanting their names and their IDs. They carry out signs that read, quote, in Chile se sigue torturando, in Chile torture continues, complementing this metaphor with that of si no hay justicia, hay funa. If there is no justice, there is funa. Despite neoliberal efforts to turn victimizers into victims and thus to close the issue of the dictatorship, victimizers are still incriminated within society. And despite neoliberal efforts to even resignify memory sites, critical memory practice continues. This practice uh, resists declarations such as Chilean writer Mauricio Rojas' 2015 statement explaining that, quote, more than a museum, the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Santiago is a farce, end quote. Considering that in August 2012, Rojas was named Minister of Culture by the current president of Chile, the conservative millionaire Sebastián Piñera, Cultural workers organized by the poet Raúl Zurita organized a massive act at the Museum of Memory and Human Rights. The title, Volver a Pensar por el Corazón, Go uh, Back and Thinking with the Heart, one of the organizers of the event said, quote, as cultural workers, we are here to confirm our commitment to human rights and culture and to invite all citizens and an entire political spectrum to a great national agreement for human rights truth and justice. We are making this act to celebrate life and to say that without memory, there is no future. The aesthetics, politics, and poetics of George Memorial are certainly not buried, despite the memorial being located underground beneath the Museum Plaza. George Memorial, just as his 1974 Pablo, and the representational act addressing memory and the problem in the problematic context of the memory boom are always political. There are, much, there are practices about survival, resistance, and building something for the future, instead of burying the past in the realm of neoliberal spectacle, pardon, and reconciliation. George's memorial at the Museum of Memory is thus a, a testimony of resistance, existence, and an energetic tool to continue the struggle. George's memorial is a testimony of dynamic memory. Thank you.